today's message is titled, The Other Side of Fear. The Other Side of Fear. Now, I think it's interesting. Today I'm going to be talking about the other side of fear, because if you, you know me at all personally, um, I have several fears, uh, most of which I believe is uh, rational. Can we get the lights brought up just a little bit? I assume there's people out there. I hear them laugh. Okay. Um, so I have several fears, most of which uh, are, I think, rational fears. Um, for example, I'm, a, I'm afraid of heights. I'll admit it. I'm afraid of heights. Um, I'm, I'm afraid of, like, being stuck. I won't say just tight places because if I can get myself into somewhere, I assume I can get back out. Um, but if you try to, like, put me in a box, we're going to throw blows. Okay? So I don't like to be stuck. Um, and then one of my more irrational fears is uh, I, I don't like birds. Birds, I just, I don't know. And, and I, think, I think it stems, I think it stems from my first and only church camp experience. I believe this story I'm about to tell you is why it took me so long to find Jesus, okay? Because the only time I ever went to church camp, we were outdoors um, and, and we were in this giant gazebo thing. It was like two stories tall, but up in the top there were bats, I don't know why. The devil was in that place, okay? But there were bats, and they were just filled. And, like, we'd be in there, and we'd be sitting there talking. You'd hear them making all kinds of creepy noises, you know, bat noises. And uh, I had this super cool, super trendy uh, rat tail at the time. Um, I had to share that for the rest of the story to make sense, or I'd have left it out. But, uh, yeah, so I had this super cool rat tail at the time. Um, and the preacher was up there, you know, talking, doing his thing. He was preaching. I wasn't listening. That was probably part of the problem. Um, and all of a sudden, a bat swoops down and lands in my cool rat tail and lunges itself and just gets stuck and then begins to, like, freak out. So I, in part, do the same. Um, and I, like, jump up screaming like, you know, a schoolgirl. And I'm freaking out. Like, I'm running around. I'm pretty sure everyone thought I just got, like, the Holy Ghost or something. Uh, <laughs> It was, it was horrible, um, but finally, like, you know, the preacher jumps off the stage and he wrestles the bat out of my hair. I don't know if this happened before because he really seemed to know what he was doing. Um, so anyway, I don't like things that flutter, you know, whenever you, something comes at you and they go, you know, all over. I don't like it. Keep it away. So I don't like birds. I don't like bats either by extension, but I encounter birds more often than bats. Um, so that's probably one of my more irrational fears and uh, why it took me so long to come to Jesus, I'm pretty sure. Um, so that, that's my first humiliating story. I, I have two for you this morning in case the first one didn't take. All right? So I'm also afraid of heights, which I think is a rational fear because I don't want to fall and die. I mean, that, that seems rational. Birds are probably not going to kill me. Falling will, okay? Um, so raise your hand. In first service, I wasn't that alone. Who else is afraid of heights? That I would admit it. Yeah, go ahead. Own up to it, yeah. See, I found whenever I was younger, I used to act all tough, uh, but then people want you to do stupid things. So I just get it out of the way real early. Nope, not getting on that. Mm -mm. No, it goes over six feet, not happening. Okay? Right? Just get it out of the way, and then no one will ask you to do, you know, come help clean their gutters or anything. Right? If you just admit right off the bat you're afraid of heights. Um, so I am afraid of heights, but it's, it, that's one of those fears that I've sort of like temporarily, at least at moments, been able to overcome. Um, like when I worked at Colinks, I had to ride on a lift that went really high in the sky because uh, that, they paid me to do it. Um, so I kind of had to overcome it in, in that part. Um, and then here at the church, things need to be done. Like this projector over here was out a couple weeks ago. I had to go up and fix it. Um, and who knows that when you're afraid of heights, when you go up somewhere and begin to do a simple, mundane, everyday task, like things just become incredibly difficult. Yeah, okay. No one else? So I I'm up there. D d there's four screws, just little Allen wrench screws. I dropped my Allen wrench about 62 times. All the way down. I have to go all the way down, go get it come back up, bop my head on the stupid bar they put there for some reason, and go back up and try again, over and over. Like, these simple, easy tasks just become so incredibly difficult because this fear kind of, like, paralyzes you, right? Um, and, and the same thing, like, when I, I changed one of the bulbs, because we had the lift, we might as well make use of it, so I had to change one of the bulbs in the gym because it went out, and that was a whole different battle because at least here, the ceiling's kind of slanted, there's something beside you, doesn't feel like you're that high, Now I'm up there trying to change a bulb like this, like shaking, the whole lift is like shaking from the tremors from my body. And like I, I leave fingerprints in this metal bar beside me. And like it's not coming out, I'm done. I actually did that. Then I had to go back up and do it because Sherry told me to. <laughs> but it's cool. We got it done. And now the gym's all bright again. 
But simple, everyday, easy tasks become so difficult when you're faced with fear. Last story, and this is the one that is truly humiliating, but I felt like I would share it with you, um, is last year at Winter Conference, uh, that's the, the trip we take all our kids to every year, we went to Wonderworks on the last day. Now, if you're not familiar with Wonderworks, it's this cool upside-down house. Inside of it, they have uh, all these exhibits and like different games, and they have like a rock wall and a ropes course. Um, and I actually enjoy the ropes course. I do. And it's, it's four stories tall, and uh, there's several different ropes. There's like a tight rope, and there's like ladder ropes and all kinds of stuff. Anyway, you just got to go across them. I enjoy the ropes course. I enjoy the first two levels of the ropes course, anyway. But while we were there, pretty much all of our, our whole youth group was on this ropes course at this time. And, uh, and I knew what was going to inevitably happen. Is I'm down on the first two levels just having a grand old time, you know. I was good. I was happy. I had a smile on my face, okay? And then everyone else slowly, one by one, start going up to the top level. I knew it was going to happen. And then I knew it was going to happen immediately following that, too, is that they were going to start shouting down insults because I would not come to their level. And at this point, I think it was just me and Brooke still down on, like, the first two levels. And, uh, and I'm just ignoring them. I'm not hearing anything. They say. I'm just going to cross my ropes, right? I, I care nothing about what they're saying. I want no part of that next level. Um, but then Brooke Caves, I remember that, and she abandoned me on the bottom level. And she went up, and then I was just all alone with all the little kids. Um, uh, which I was still cool. I was just, da, 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 da. but they're still yelling things at me. And so I'm like, finally, okay, I'm coming. So I start up the stairs, and these stairs, there's probably like 10 or 12 of them, right? So I start up them, and I start to realize the higher I go, the more my legs decide to stop working. And like every step, I'm like, like panting, my heart's beating. I'm like, pretty sure I'm going to die. Not from falling, just heart attack. Right here, just dangling in the air. And to make matters worse, like I'm getting halfway up. I'm like even with everyone else's feet, and they're just having a jolly time. And I'm deciding, okay, I'm done. I'm just turning around, going back down. I'm going to go like look at the rocket ship or something, right? Um, and then I turn around, and there's like a five-year-old behind me <laughs> trying to get up. <laughs> and like... And there's no, like, two people, there's one rail, you just, you just got to go. Um, and I turn around, like, I'm coming back down. He doesn't read my cues. He's just waiting for me. And I'm like, get out of my way, kid. And uh, he doesn't. So I have to go all the way up to the next level. <laughs> like, I literally have to force myself. This is like toddlers trying to get by me. Um, and I go, and I go, like, around the little corner, like, hugging the pole they have there. I let him go by. I go back down, and that was my story for the day. <laughs> yes, it was uh, humiliating. <laughs> as, as it sounded. Um, I tell you that for that, that short, the short little segment about how my legs quit working, okay? Because if you're ever like faced your fear of heights or claustrophobia or just being in a new place surrounded with a bunch of people, like you suddenly like your body starts to do weird things, right? Your body is like your heart starts beating, your hands are like sweaty, you can't feel your legs, like your mouth doesn't work anymore. Like for some reason your body decides this is the opportune time to just shut down. It's like, no, trust me, you're good. You'll just die. Like is that at this moment, <laughs> like I'm just standing there on these stupid steps and like my body just shuts down. And I, and I want to say, and the whole purpose of this message is that fear oftentimes will paralyze us. Fear oftentimes will stop us in our tracks. It, 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 will, it will hinder us from moving forward. And, and this is true, obviously, in life. Like, if you're afraid of heights, it's going to stop you from, you know, having certain experiences. Um, but it goes even further than that. If, you're, if you've been hurt in a relationship before, the fear of being hurt is going to hinder you from letting other people in, right? If, if you don't like change, your fear of change is going to hinder you from having new, possibly good experiences. And, and I've found, especially in my Christian walk, that my, my fear of confrontation will often lead me to not live wholeheartedly for God, right? Because so often, we as Christians, and this is going to be kind of our focus, we as Christians, we want to avoid opposition as much as possible. But so often, when we are trying to avoid opposition, we're no longer living for God. Because God did not call us to a life of passivity, he called us to a life of action for him, right? That's the life that we're ultimately called to. So this message today is going to be titled, The Other Side of Fear. And it's, it's almost fully inspired by this quote. Everything you've ever wanted is on the other side of fear. 
But I want to take it one step further because I don't, I don't necessarily believe that part's true. I think that everything God wants for you is on the other side of fear. That so often, like when we read through Scripture, we see no one who accomplishes a mighty work for God without first having to overcome a fear of some sort or overcome some sort of obstacle. We see Moses couldn't talk plain, yet he had to go speak to Pharaoh. Right? We see Joshua with a, you know, a, a limited army taking down Jericho. We see all throughout Scripture people who were, had to overcome certain obstacles to do a mighty work for God. And I think that if we are to truly live for Jesus, if we're going to live for God and wholeheartedly live for God, there's certain fears we have to overcome. And today we're going to be talking about uh, a man named Stephen and about the fears that he overcame. You see, but if you want to go and turn your Bibles there, get your scripture there, we're going to be reading in Acts 6 and 7 today. But we're going to be talking a little bit about Stephen. But more importantly, we're going to be talking about fear and what fear does to us as followers of Jesus and how fear affects how we can live for God. Because I think that same fear that um, stopped me from getting to the next level of, of the ropes course, it's that same fear that fills us and stops us from living for God. And, and to give you a, a prime example of that, think back to the last time you told someone about Jesus. Now, if that hasn't happened recently or you can't remember, then think about going out today and telling the waitress at Cracker Barrel about Jesus. Now, what we're going to find is as soon as that kind of conviction hits our heart and we're like, we should tell this person about Jesus or we should invite them to church, you know, at the least... When that happens, all of a sudden, fear starts to set in. And all those same emotions start to happen. Your palms start to get sweaty. Your heart starts to beat hard. You no longer hear anything they're saying because you're just trying to focus on what you're going to say next. And then all of a sudden, they quit talking long enough for you to be like, do you want to go to uh, that place on Sundays that we go to every once in a while uh, and we talk about this guy who did cool stuff um, church, do you want to go to church? It's, you don't have to. I mean, you don't have to like wear a dress or anything. You know, if you don't, you're probably busy. Do you work on Sundays? I, it's, we come off super awkward because we let fear set in. And they're like, um, no, thank you, because I'm not going anywhere with that person, right? But statistics tell us that 80% of people would attend church if they were simply invited. That if we could control the fear long enough to simply walk up to someone and be like, hey, I'd love if you come to church with me. I can meet you there. I can give you a ride. I don't know what that looks like. But, you know, if we could simply ask that, if we could overcome that fear, it says that 80% of people would accept the invitation. You see, and I think that's interesting because as we look around, there are plenty of empty seats. And some people would view that as a negative. But I think that is an opportunity to fill that seat with someone who doesn't normally go to church. Yeah, if we're, if we're full, we can bring anybody. We got plenty of seats. Tell someone you'll save them a seat. That is an opportunity to bring someone who wouldn't normally come to church. Just imagine for a moment. Just imagine. What if the church, the capital C, the church of Jesus, what if the church actually lived fearlessly? What if we were able to be bold yet loving And we would approach people with respect and kindness, but we would tell them the truth about Jesus. What would the church look like? Again, capital C church, not necessarily just Grace Community Church, but what would the church of Jesus in America look like if we as followers of Jesus could overcome our fear and just see what's on the other side of fear? What would that look like? So I'm going to read in Acts 6, 1 through 10 to start off, and then we'll cover some more of it. So if you have your Bibles, if you have your phone with the super cool Bible app, go there now. If not, it'll be right back here. So Acts chapter 6. But as the believers rapidly multiplied, there were rumblings of discontent. The Greek-speaking believers complained about the Hebrew-speaking believers, saying that their widows were being discriminated against in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve called a meeting of all the believers. They said, we apostles should spend our time teaching the word of God, not running a food program. And so, brothers, select seven men who are well-respected and are full of spirit and wisdom. We will give them this responsibility. Then the apostles can spend our time in prayer and teaching the word. 
Everyone liked this idea, and they chose the following men, or following Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit. Look how many times the word full comes up. I know Teresa spoke about it a couple weeks ago. Pastor Dennis spoke about it last week. We are all full of something. And it says that they're looking for men who are full of the Spirit. It says that Stephen, he is full of faith, and he is full of the Holy Spirit. And then some other guys, Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenius, and Nicholas of Antioch, an earlier convert to the Jewish faith. These seven were presented to the apostles who prayed for them as they laid their hands on them. So God's message continued to spread. The number of believers greatly increased in Jerusalem, and many of the Jewish priests were converted too. Stephen, again, a man full of God's grace and power, performed amazing miracles and signs among the people. But one day, some men from the synagogue of freed slaves, as it was called, started to debate with him. They were Jews from Cyrene, Alexandria, Cilicia, and the province of Asia. None of them could stand against the wisdom and the spirit with which Stephen spoke. Now, we're going to focus on this man named Stephen. And we're going to focus on what, the, what Scripture tells us about Stephen. So the only details that we really know are that Stephen was full of faith, he was full of the Holy Spirit, he was full of grace, he was full of power, he performed amazing signs and miracles. And some Jewish teachers came up and tried to debate with him, and apparently he was full of the Spirit enough and intellectual enough that he defeated them in a debate. And I got to think that they were fairly surprised because they just came up to the guy that was waiting on tables thinking they were going to show him up with their knowledge of, you know, religion, and he just schooled them, I think is what just happened. They're like tell, trying to tell the waiter about their God, and he's like, no, nah, bro, let me tell you, okay? This is what I picture. I, I don't know. That was, that was what I got out of it. But I want to focus on who Stephen is because I think it's powerful because Stephen, from what we can tell, he's the only one that, out of the seven that they tell us anything else about. And it says that he is full of power, full of grace, full of the Spirit. He performed amazing signs, amazing miracles. Here in just a moment, he is going to preach the longest sermon in the entire book of Acts. Stephen is a talented dude, right? I mean, he's clearly got it together. Like, he has everything kind of going for him. I would say that he is overqualified. And yet, what do they have Stephen doing? Stephen is waiting on tables, essentially. Stephen is feeding the widows. That's the job that he got. That's the job that he's doing. Yet it would seem, at least through Scripture, that he is qualified to be doing much more, that he's qualified to be teaching and preaching, to go heal the sick, to do, be doing amazing things. Yet when Stephen received his calling, he simply said, okay. And he put his head down and he began to work hard. Which brings me to my first point. And if you guys have your journal or paper or pen or you know, anything like that, that you can write this down and memorize this, that all of these things we're going to be talking about are about Stephen, but I believe they are essential to us as followers of Jesus. So the first thing we get from Stephen's actions is Stephen wasn't afraid to serve. That Stephen was not afraid to serve. Now, he was clearly qualified to be doing amazing things. He was clearly qualified to be teaching, preaching, healing, you know, being one of the big guys, the guys that are glorified, that are talked about, you know. He was qualified to be doing this. Yet when his call came to wait on tables, he did it with his whole heart, that he worked hard at it. He didn't, you know, begin to gripe and complain and talk about how good of a teacher he was and how he can heal just as much as Peter can and how he should be one of the big dogs and he should get paid more. And No, his call came and he served wholeheartedly. And I believe that as believers, as followers of Jesus, that each and every one of us is called to serve. Right? Each and every one of us, we read scripture, we read through the book Acts, there's not a single person not doing something. That when we read scripture... All believers are serving to some extent. And we as believers, as followers of Jesus, are called to serve. And I think we do this in, in three possible ways. Number one, we do this, we serve out of skill. We serve out of skill. Now, a lot of us, we have practical skills. That whether we're an electrician, a plumber, a carpenter, a mechanic, 
that we use our skills that we've gained as a service to the Lord, that we donate those skills, that we, we give to those skills to someone in need, that we help where we can, that we serve the local body, that we serve here at the church, that we, we serve with the skills that we've gained. Now, for some of us, we serve out of talent. Talent. Now, talent is this natural ability to do something, whether that's a musical talent or a technological talent or you just have a, a natural ability to, to lead or to teach, that we would serve with that talent. We would use that talent to glorify God. And that we can do that in many different ways, in many different, whether it's partnering with a church, whether it's serving here at church, or it's working with a nonprofit, we use our talents for the glory of God. Now, I do believe that we can also use our skills and our talents for profit, for ourselves, but we should also be willing to use them to serve. And finally, and what I think is the most important one, and what we see out of Stephen, is that we serve out of need. We serve out of need. You see, Stephen was not... As far as we can tell, it doesn't exactly mention, he was not an expert waiter. He was not an an expert food server. But there was a need, there was a job that needed to be done, and Stephen did it. And I think the most important one for us as Christians, as followers of Jesus, is that when we see a need, we step up and we serve in that place. Now, we may have five PhDs and be a doctor or a lawyer or have a Grammy or whatever. If we are a follower of Jesus, when we see a need... We start pouring coffee. When we see a need, we start opening doors. We start saying hello to people. We start singing on stage. We, when there's a need, as a Christian, it doesn't matter how qualified we feel or what we feel like we should be doing. When there's a need, we fill that gap and we serve out of need. And maybe we don't like it and we don't enjoy it. And maybe one day someone will come in and fill that spot that does enjoy it. But until then, we do the service because we're doing it for God and not for ourselves. Right? And Stephen served where there was a need. He, see, he saw a need, and he began to serve. But we have to serve with the right intention. Right? Because so often, and in today's culture, and I'll admit it in my generation, the next generation, we very much live in a look-at-me culture. A, a culture that says, look at me, look at what I'm doing, look at how good I am, look at how superior I am. And so often we begin to give, and we begin to serve, and we begin to do good things simply so other people can see how good that we are. And when we kind of get into that, Jesus says that when we do things in front of other people, then we've already had our blessing. You see, it's when we serve for the glory of God that when we serve for God, for people, not for our own glory, it is then that I believe that we will be blessed. But so often we just serve out of selfish ambition. But God blesses selflessness, not selfishness. And I mean, I'm just as guilty as anybody. When I went to Haiti, I have 350 photos of myself, right? But we have got to teach ourselves. We've got to learn to serve for God and for God alone and that we can bless other people. It's not about us anymore. In fact, one of my good buddies, one of my good YouTube friends, he just put out a video this week and he said this quote, God will do what only he can do when you realize your dream is not about you. I'm going to say it one more time because it's a, it's a little bit long. I want you to get it. God will do what only he can do when you realize your dream is not about you. And I think that's absolutely right. That, again, when we look at Scripture, when we look at any big figure, they didn't do amazing things for God for their own benefit. David didn't slay Goliath so that he could be known as the giant killer. He did it to give glory to God. Moses didn't free the Israelites so Moses could be an amazing leader. Moses did it for the glory of God. Joshua, again, didn't walk around Jericho seven times for his own glory that he could be known as the greatest army captain in the world. He did it for the glory of God. And that once we realize the things we do, when we realize the reasons that we serve, the reasons that we give, the reasons that we volunteer is not for us, it's not for our glory, Listen, if we're getting payment, even if that payment is just is looking good, then we're not volunteering anymore because we got something out of it. We volunteer, we serve for the glory of God. And I think we do that when we find a need. And it's very simple to do. Look around. What's not being done well, there's a need there. That's how you spot it in any place, whether that be a church, a nonprofit, just working with random people, with random families. If something needs to be done, we serve because there's a need. That's what we do as Christians. 
And that's what we see in Stephen, is that he began to serve because there was a need. Let's read on. Verse 11. So they persuaded some men. Remember, Stephen just got in a debate uh, with some other guys, and he whipped up on them pretty bad, and this is what they do. So they persuaded some men to lie about Stephen, saying, We heard him blaspheme Moses and even God. This roused the people and elders and the teachers of the religious law, so they arrested Stephen and brought him before the high council. The lying witnesses said, This man is always speaking against the holy temple and against the law of Moses. We have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy the temple and change the customs Moses handed down to us. At this point, everyone in the high council stared at Stephen because his face became as bright as an angel's. And read the next two verses of chapter 7. Then the high priest asked Stephen, Are these accusations true? This was Stephen's reply. Brothers and fathers, listen to me. Our glorious God appeared, our glorious God appeared to our ancestor Abraham in Mesopotamia before he settled in Haran. And I'm going to pause right there for just a moment. Because what's about to happen is Stephen is about to break out in the longest sermon in the book of Acts. Um, it's a very, very lengthy sermon. So what ends up happening right here, Stephen beats some guys into a debate. They come to start something with the waiter. The waiter beats them. They get mad. They convince some other guys to lie about Stephen and say that, you know, he's blaspheming God and all these other things. And the high priest shows up and he says, Stephen, are these things true? It's a very simple question. It is. It's like a yes or no kind of thing. Um, But Stephen takes this as the opportune time to deliver the longest sermon in the book of Acts. I'm pretty sure he kept all these people there for like an hour, right? Because he just begins to preach and tell them about how everything that they know about their Jewish faith leads them to Jesus. And he leads them on a long, long sermon. This brings me to my next point. Stephen wasn't afraid to stand. Stephen was not afraid to stand. You see, when faced with opposition, Stephen stood firm. He planted his feet on the foundations of truth that he knew, and he stood firm and told these Jewish people who were basically attacking him the truth of the gospel, that Stephen was not afraid to stand. And I think it's interesting because when we read uh, the other chapters of Acts, we see whenever the disciples deliver a sermon, they're almost always together. Right? They're always together, and they're, they're kind of delivering the sermon, whether Peter's the head speaker or what. They're always together. As far as we can tell from Scripture, Stephen stands alone at this moment. And he stands alone, and he stands firm, and he delivers a lengthy sermon in which he ends by telling them that they're basically heathens and that they need to get right with God. Like, he was not afraid to stand up for what he believed in. In fact, I'll I'll go and read what happens at the end. At the end of his sermon, in verse 54, it says this. The Jewish leaders were infuriated by Stephen's accusation, and they shook their fists at him in rage. Verse 57, it says that they put their hands over their ears and begun shouting. (laughs) They rushed at him. What did that look like? Can you imagine that? Because what I'm seeing is like, you know, know, a five-year-old. La, 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 don't hear you. I don't... Because that's what I'm imagining, is these grown men, like, covering up their ears and shouting. Um, But apparently, Stephen was not afraid to face opposition. Stephen wasn't afraid that even in this difficult time, when he stood alone and these Jewish people were attacking him, he was not afraid to tell them the truth of the gospel. He wasn't afraid of opposition. And I think that's something that needs to be true of us. Now, I do think that... Some Christians take it a little too far because there's a certain love and grace that we have to show people. That 1 Peter 3.15 says that we are always ready to defend our faith, but we do it with righteousness and respect. That we do it with gentleness and kindness, sorry. That we do it with gentleness and kindness. So we always have to approach every situation with gentleness and kindness and with the love that Jesus offers and that, that same grace. But at the same time, we can't be afraid to stand up for our faith. We can't be afraid of confrontation and opposition, that we we can't be afraid to stand. Because if we kneel every time there's confrontation, then it makes not only us look weak, but it makes our God look weak, and it makes our faith look weak. If every time someone says, 
that they disagree or they don't believe that or, or they have different faiths or that they're an atheist or Muslim. And every time we're like, oh man, everyone for himself. We made ourselves look weak. We made our faith look weak and we made our God look weak. But I think we have to approach this with gentleness and respect and we have to understand what we believe. Not just tell them that Jesus is real, but actually understand why we believe that Jesus is real. What Jesus has done in our life, it says we will overcome by the word of our testimony. So if we tell them what Jesus has done in our life, then maybe we can just be a reflection of Jesus to someone. And maybe they're not immediately saved and baptized that day, you know, in the, the, the little pond at the, le- or at the mall. But maybe on that day, a seed gets planted that, wow, that person really believed that. And, and maybe they start to look up something about Jesus, and they find a YouTube video, or they decide to go to a church, just based on that little conversation. No, salvation may not be instant, you may not be able to baptize them right there, but, but maybe that seed makes a difference in their life. And all we can hope is that we can plant the seed and that God will do the rest. But every time we crumble under persecution, if you can call it that, because these dudes had their heads taken off, that was persecution, Um, someone disagreeing with us and yelling and throwing a temper tantrum, I don't think it's persecution. But if we are scared of opposition, then it's not going to be long that people look on Jesus as being weak because his followers seem to be. Actually, one of my favorite apologists who just recently passed away, his name was Nabil Qureshi. Uh, He was a devout Muslim apologist. So he would come and he would find Christians and he would crush their faith and he would tell them about why Allah was real and why they should follow Muhammad. And, and he would, that was what he did. Like, that was his thing. Like, we have Christian apologists. He was a Muslim apologist until he encountered one man, a roommate, who was also a Christian apologist. And he said up until that day, he thought Christians were weak and he thought God, their God was weak. But he encountered someone who actually knew his Bible and could stand toe-to-toe with him. And on that day, or probably not that day, it took several debates. They, they went back and forth for a couple years. But Nabil finally became a Christian, and he became one of the most devout, like, strongest Christian apologists I think this world has seen. The dude was brilliant. And it was simply because he encountered a Christian who wasn't afraid of opposition. And I think that we, as Christians, we have to bring that same mentality into ourselves, but I I will say that it's not simply going to be good enough for us to be willing to argue with someone. We have to be able to argue intelligently, right? Because I, I think that we, we all know, or at least every atheist I've ever talked to has encountered a Christian that knew nothing about their Bible, and it was very easy to crush everything they thought they believed. And it's, when we know nothing about our Bible, it's very easy for what we think we believe to disintegrate because we don't know enough. And Coming from an agnostic past, I know whenever I first became a Christian, I had to teach myself everything that I could for my faith to stay strong. And anytime I would have a doubt or I'd have an insecurity, I would go back either to the Word or I'd listen to apologists like Nabil, or I would listen to other preachers. I would come to church. I would talk to Pastor Dennis. I would find someone who knew more about that Bible than I did, and I would go to them. And my strength was strengthened and strengthened, and strengthened, because I had plenty of doubts. And we will, as Christians, we'll have doubts. That's going to happen. I know we don't talk about it a lot in church circles, but there are doubts, and there are times of insecurity. There are times when we don't understand what's happening in our life. It only becomes a problem when we let those doubts linger and we never resolve them. Because if you let one doubt linger in your head, It won't take long for it spreads to another and another and another, and the enemy will use that as a foothold to climb into your life, to climb into your faith, and to separate you from God. But if we would take that doubt and we would tackle it head on and we would listen to a Christian apologist, we would talk to a senior leader here at the church, or if we would just talk to a family member who seems to know this Bible a little bit better than we do, a lot of times those doubts can be resolved. You see, but... We have to be willing, as Christians, to face opposition. Out of no other reason than love. You see, if we tell people about Jesus, I know it's super awkward and it's super weird and the conversation gets kind of strange, but if we tell people about Jesus, we're not being judgmental. We're not being bigots. We're not thinking we're better than anyone else. 
We're simply trying to love another person. Yeah, I've heard it said the best, and this is funny for me to say, I've, I've heard it said the best by an atheist. I don't know if you're familiar with Penn and Teller. Penn is a, a devout, uh, outspoken atheist. Um, but he says this. He says, I don't respect people who don't proselytize. I don't respect that at all. If you believe there is a heaven and hell and people could be going to hell or not getting eternal life or whatever, and you think it's not really worth telling them this because it would make it socially awkward, how much do you have to hate somebody to not proselytize? How much do you have to hate someone to believe everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? He goes on to give this illustration. If I believed beyond a shadow of a doubt that a truck was coming at you and, didn't be, and you didn't believe it, that that truck was bearing down on you, there's a certain point that I would tackle you because that is more important than you getting hit by the truck. Now, I obviously disagree with Penn on, on several things, but I have to agree with this. How much do we have to hate someone that if we had a cure for a disease that they were dying from that we wouldn't tell them about it? Because sin is a disease. And the mortality rate is 100%. We're all going to die. But if we have the cure for that disease, why would we not tell somebody? So it would make it a little awkward. So they may not believe us. But what if they did? Just what if they did? You see, because I think, I think it's amazingly powerful that we can save people, that modern medicine is so powerful that we can save lives. I think that's amazing. But the thing about it is, if we save someone's life, it's temporary. This rope's longer than I thought it was. It's temporary. Because you see, our life, our life looks a lot like this black streak right here. It's short. By all, there you go. Our life is short. I mean, it, within the realm of eternity, it's, it's roughly this much. If we're already in age a little bit, it's about this much. So if we could save someone's life, that would be amazing, that would be honorable, that would be respectable, but we have still saved it for about this long. Right? Everyone's amazed that Jesus saved Lazarus. I'm more, I'm more amazed that he saved you and me. Because Lazarus still died again. But you and me, when we have eternal life, we will never die. This life is temporary. It'll fade away one day. That's cool. But we don't need it anymore. But what we need to do as Christians, don't think this doesn't matter. Because this right here, however long we have left, that is our chance to get other people here. If, if we're this close, that means we only have these many more years to reach the people closest to us with Jesus. Because the thing is, if I can cure your cancer and get you this much more, that's great. Fantastic. But the thing is, is there's something so much more important. Because life is temporary. Life is short. Life will end. Eternity is not. Eternity is everlasting. It's, it's much larger, much longer, much more important than life is. Now, it's great if we can use that life to get more people here. But essentially, the only thing that matters is here. Because that is, that is but a minute in comparison to eternity right but we focus so much on the life on this short short period of time and we're worried that we're gonna offend somebody or make just a short moment just make a short moment awkward but that short moment of awkwardness of that opposition of that confrontation matters absolutely none in the realm of forever Right, and the sad fact is, is it's not that Christians are going to go to heaven and unbelievers are just not going to exist anymore. The sad fact is, if we believe that book, is that eternity is for everybody. Right, that there is an eternity after this life for everybody. Now, you're either spending that eternity in heaven or you're spending that eternity in eternal damnation. And that's the sad fact. So, it matters more than anything that we get other people, that we use this small black speck to get other people to the eternity that we plan to be in. That matters more than anything else. So yes, that may mean that we have to have some opposition, that we may have to have some words, that there may be some awkwardness. But if we truly believe this, 
And if we don't, that's, that's another thing. We've got to work on that first. But if we believe this book, if we believe in Jesus, if we believe that there is life after this one, there is nothing more important than getting other people there. Nothing. And that's the exact command Jesus gives us. Acts 1, 8, he says, go out into all the world and tell them about me. That is our command. That's our number one mission is to get other people there. If we're a Christian, we're already saved. Nothing else matters. I mean, make money, take care of your family, but get other people to Jesus. The most important thing, and Stephen knows that. Stephen knows that the most important thing is not whether he lives or dies. It's whether he can take a few people with him to eternity. And so he takes this moment of opposition, of confrontation, knowing most likely what was going to happen. He knew, he knew what was going to come for the law that they were claiming he broke, yet he took this moment to tell them about Jesus. We'll pick up and we'll finish reading in verse 51. This is following his sermon. This is right after it. I highly recommend when you get home to go back and read Acts 7 and read his whole sermon. Um, but I assume you all want to go to lunch today, so I'm going to skip it. He goes on, he says, you stubborn people, you are heathen at heart and deaf to the truth. Must you forever resist the Holy Spirit? That's what your ancestors did and so do you. Name one prophet your ancestors didn't persecute. They even killed the ones who predicted the coming of the righteous one, the Messiah whom you betrayed and murdered. You deliberately disobeyed God's law even though you received it from the hands of angels. The Jewish leaders were infuriated by Stephen's accusation, and they shook their fists at him with rage. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed steadily into heaven and saw the glory of God. And he saw Jesus standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. And he told them, look, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. Then they put their hands over their ears and began shouting, ah! They rushed at him and dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. His accusers took off their coats and laid them at the feet of a young man named Saul. I think it's also interesting, that was the first sermon that Paul ever heard. As they stoned him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He fell to his knees shouting, Lord, don't charge them with this sin. And then he died. Brings me to my next point. Stephen wasn't afraid to surrender. Stephen wasn't afraid to surrender. But notice, he didn't surrender to men. He didn't cave to peer pressure. And he didn't do as they asked. He surrendered to God. He said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He surrendered all of him to God. And I believe that each and every one of us, as followers of Jesus, we are called to a life of surrender. Now, most likely, being in America, we're not going to surrender our lives. But we are called to surrender something. Whether that simply be our time, our skills, our talents, our money, pieces of our life, our loyalty, some of us, I believe, are called to go to a third world country and surrender our luxury, all for the glory of God. That we are called to surrender, right? Because our prayer of salvation isn't, Jesus, I accept you as Savior. That's part of it. It's Jesus, I accept you as Lord. Lord. And the, the politically incorrect version of that is, Jesus, I accept you as Master as in a master-slave relationship, if we look at the original language. It's, Jesus, I accept you as Lord of all. You see, because if Jesus is not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. We don't get to be selective at what part of our life we are giving up. We are called to surrender it all to him, to lay it all at the foot of the cross. That is what we are called to do. And I'm going to close with this final statement about Stephen. Stephen. Stephen wasn't afraid of the silence. Stephen was not afraid of the silence. Now, I think it's interesting that at the end of his sermon, at the end of his sermon, Jesus appears at the right hand of the Father. But what I think is interesting 
is that Jesus didn't show up until the end of his sermon. That means from the beginning, from when these Jews first started to persecute him, until Jesus appears, he has to do all that what appears to be alone and in silence. That Stephen faced an incredibly dark time, an incredibly dark moment that he's being persecuted. I could see the looks of these Jewish people as they're facing him. And I think he has to know what is coming because he would have known the law. He would have known what the punishment was for the crimes he was being convicted of. That I think it was in this moment that he had faith in Jesus. Right? Because he, he, he spoke boldly. He spoke with confidence. You see, because even though Jesus appeared at the right hand of the Father at the end of his sermon, I think he knew that God was there with him the entire time. That the Holy Spirit was on him, that Jesus was present with him. Because God says that he will never leave us, nor will he forsake us, that he'll always be with us. And I want that to be an encouragement as we close here today for you, that wherever you're at or whatever you're facing, the troubles that you're going through, the persecutions you may feel, the losses you've had, the doubts you've had, the dark moments that you've failed to. I want you to know you're not alone. You can have the same faith that Stephen had in the silence is that God is still present. God is still with you. He is just as with you as he was the moment of salvation when you failed him the most. He has never left and he has never forsaken you. He is always present and he is always with you. That's the God that we serve. Jesus loves you so much. He loves you so, so very much. And I'm going to end with this scripture. In Matthew 11, Jesus says this, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And this is interesting, I had Anthony talk to me a little bit after first service. And he said his interpretation of this is that he was speaking, Jesus was speaking to these Jews who were burdened by the law. They were burdened by this law they were constantly trying to live up to, but they were never quite able. And he said, it's okay. I know your burden is heavy, but give it to me. For my yoke is easy. For my yoke is light, that I will lift it. I will give you a true rest. Jesus is saying that to each and every one of us here today, that I know you are burdened. I know you feel the weight of the world on your shoulders, that there is stress that we can't imagine, that there is trouble in our families we can't imagine, that our life may not be going the way we had planned and we may have doubts and insecurities and brokenness. And though we feel the weight of all that on us, Jesus is saying, give it to me. Look up to me. Follow me. I will never leave you nor will I forsake you. I am always with you to the very ends of the earth and nothing you can do can separate me from that love because I am always with you. Jesus loves you and he is for you. I've asked the worship team to come out and sing this last song. I want them to sing Reckless Love one more time because this song has just been, it's been so powerful for me. It's been stuck in my head to know that God's love for me is reckless. No, God himself may not be reckless, but his love is. He was so reckless that he went to a cross and he shed his love on a cross for me. That's the love of our mighty Father. That's the love of our Jesus, that he was reckless for us. And I wanna tell you guys just a short, short story happened this morning as I got here. The worship team was practicing and Dennis was leading prayer. And during the prayer, he he began to pray for me and this message I had. And and in that moment while he was praying, I just, I started to have some doubts, some sort of insecurities. and And I couldn't help but think, you know, why would God why would God use me? Because I don't know if you know it, I'm, I'm a messed up dude. Like I've got some quirks about me. Why would God use me? And there was immediately in this, that moment that I'm thinking that why would God use me that I just got this mental picture and I truly believe it was from God and, and it was just a picture of London in time out. And it was a memory of uh, the day she broke my phone. She uh, was playing my phone and I needed it back to make a call or something. and. And I went to get it and she got mad. She threw it off the back of the couch. And it it made that sound that if you've ever broke a phone, you know the sound. 
And I went and picked it up and it was broken. So I grabbed her and I, I sat her down the time out and I was just furious. And I walked away and I turned around and looked at her and she was just sitting over there, hunched over. I wasn't mad anymore. I looked at her and all I could do was love her. All I could do was see the love I have for that little girl. That even in this moment when she messed up, when she broke something that was precious to me, I couldn't do anything but love her. That's the reckless love that God has for us. The love of a father that when we have messed up, when we've broke what is precious to him, he looks at us not in anger, but in love. That he loves us despite our flaws, despite our imperfections, despite anything we've ever done or could ever do. Jesus loves you no matter what. I want you guys to leave here with that confidence that you have the love of a father and nothing you could ever do could separate you from him. He loves you through everything. Let's pray. I want to take just a moment to speak to anyone here who may not know Jesus. That maybe you've heard the stories, you've been to an Easter program or two, but you've never actually accepted Jesus as Savior, as Lord and as Savior. If that's you here today, I want to make sure I give you that opportunity, that I don't leave here without you having that chance to follow Jesus, to commit your life to Him. If that's you here today and you want to make that decision, I'm going to count to three and on three, I want you to lift your hand and you're welcome to put it right back down. And I'm just gonna ask you to pray a simple prayer with me to Jesus. If that's you today and you wanna make that decision and accept this love of God, on the count of three, I want you to lift your hand and you can put it right back down. One, two, three. Awesome. awesome. If that was you today and you wanna make that decision, I want you to simply repeat this prayer after me, but you're not just saying words, you're praying it to Jesus. You're speaking these words to him as he sits right in front of you, because he is present. Just like he was with Stephen, he is with you. He is always there. Pray this to him. Say, Jesus, today I give you my life. Today I make you Lord and Savior. I accept your eternal gift. I believe you are the Son of God that you died for my sins. You were resurrected from the grave. Jesus, today, I give you every piece of me. I will live my life for you the best I can, and I will seek you always. Amen. Let's pray as a body. Lord, I thank you so much. For each and every person in here, God, I thank you for the people who decided to follow you today. God, that their life would never be the same but instead, God, that they would commit every single day to you, that they would follow you. God, I pray that the rest of us, that any fears that we have, we would, we would get over because eternity matters much more than an awkward moment. God, that we would pursue you, that we would seek you with every bit of us, that any doubts or flaws or insecurities that we have, we would give them up to you, God, because your yoke is easy. Your burdens are light, God. We give it to you today, and we follow you. God, I just pray that you'll be with each and every person in here, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.